I'm going to talk a little bit about young people, because how many people, is that your primary uh, work areas with, with uh, adolescents, teenagers, young, young adults? So not all of them. Okay. Well, I'm very concerned about our, our youth, because what we know is that early exposure leads to more problems. And this is a really interesting study. It's basically a study of parents' feelings about substance use in a family that says, no way, no how, you don't use in my house. If you use, there's a consequence, your cell phone's gone. Next time, you're going to be in a private school. Next time, you're not going to live with me. This house, they say, well, we really prefer you not to use, but if you're going to drink, drink in our basement. I'd like to be the one to drive you home. So it's a little bit more permissive. It says neither disapprove, uh, neither approve nor disapprove. Look at the difference in use between marijuana, 5%, 27%, <coughs> cigarettes, 8%, 45%, and alcohol, 13%, 40%. So what it really says is that parenting, you know, Nancy Reagan had it right. Just say no. <laughs> and having zero tolerance in the household and in the community makes some sense from a data standpoint. We know that the earlier kids are exposed to drugs, the more likely it will be that they end up in trouble. Um, in kids, first drug of abuse is what? Cigarettes. Nicotine. Tobacco. And that predisposes to ongoing problems. Um, there's a reversal, a reversal of gender vulnerability, at least with prescription drugs. 12 to 17 year old girls are a little greater than boys, and dependence and abuse, uh, females uh, abuse, they, they abuse to increase confidence, reduce tension, cope with problems, lose inhibitions, or lose weight in the case of the stimulants. And it's easier access and less social stigma. So that's really one of the issues that comes up for girls versus boys. So in view of everything we've learned about drugs, we now know that they do it anyway. You know, they have that compulsion to use because of this brain abnormality. So there's a, Frank Netter drew that one, it's a little better than mine, but just to review, you know, there's the cerebral cortex, the frontal lobe, and there's the midbrain, and there's the cerebellum. The disease of addiction is in the midbrain. If we cut the brain, and this is these are slides from the National Institute of Drug Abuse, we will see that this is that script that, that really is right in the midbrain there, called the nucleus accumbens ventral tegmental area. And that's the area above the brain stem that's responsible for emotions and motivations. Emotions and motivation. So we've already talked about survival, fear, anger, and pleasure, which is sex and eating, but also these are areas that affect early learning and memory processing. Frontal cortex is the seat of judgment, reasoning, problem solving, rational decision making. It governs, and this is really key with young people, impulsivity, aggression, ability to organize thoughts and plan for the future. So if you have a disease of the midbrain, in an adolescent, you know, what's going on in the frontal lobe of an adolescent? Doesn't it sound like adolescents there? You know, impulsive, aggressive, disorganized. I mean, that's sort of natural adolescence as the, the brain matures. If you expose that brain to drugs, we're in deep trouble. And we are culturally in deep trouble. Now, does that mean that kids who do drugs and break the law and lie, cheat, and steal, or anybody who does that, is a bad person? You know, where is the seat of morality? in the frontal cortex. So the primitive brain is surrounded by the part of the brain that has values, judgment, logic, reason. It's the seat of personality. How many people like the term addictive personality? No such thing. There is no such thing. And this is really key in understanding addiction because personality is where? It's in the frontal lobe. This is not a disease of the frontal lobe. People act like antisocial people because they lie, they cheat, and they steal. Now, some of the people who are in your system, in your court, or in your uh, defense pool, are also antisocial. You know, there are kids who are, have no value on right and wrong, but that's not the vast majority of people who have this disease. They stand in front of you, and they feel really bad about disappointing their families, and they do it anyway. They're continuing to use despite negative consequences because they have the disease of the midbrain. Not a personality disorder. And that's really key. 
Because we feel like if they just tried harder, anybody tempted to think that? If they just were, just worked at it more, if they were just better people, if they just behaved better, they would do better. And I'm here to tell you that they're being driven by a part of the brain that says, I need this drug to survive. That's a big difference. So we can't rely on personality. And anybody think willpower works good for addiction? You know, try it next time you have the flu and a bad case of diarrhea. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we titter and chuckle about that thought, and, and the, as it unfolds, you get the visual. That's as, it's as logical to use willpower against addiction as it is to use willpower against diarrhea when you have the food. And then we get to love, morality, decency, responsibility, and spirituality. That's the frontal lobe's job. That's not where kids are driven or where people are driven to do the drug.